So good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you so much for joining us for this week's 120 Dublin Stories with Santa Rita and the Little Museum of Dublin. Um, our guest tonight is Dr. Rona Mahoney, a consultant obstetrician, a Little Museum board member, and a former um, master of the National Maternity Hospital. So Rona, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you, and thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be invited. Oh, very much appreciated. Um, well, as ever, if um, if anyone has questions as we go through the evening, please do type them in and we will work our way through them. But um, Rona, I'm going to jump in and just ask you a question to start us off. <laughs> um, so Rona, I, I'd love to know just a little bit more about yourself and your own background, you know, and your, your journey towards becoming a doctor. Um, was this a childhood goal or how did it come about? I'm always so embarrassed about the story. <laughs> Because very sadly, I told it early on. But um, so I grew up in Rohini in Maywood and across the road lived Mrs. Redmond. She was a nurse in St. James's and she always came home with amazing stories of the hospital. Um, and then I got the old Fisher Price. Do you remember those doctor yes. kits? And you could really hear your heart. Um, and I was so excited by this. So I decided early on that I would like to be a doctor. Um, and then I remember in second year, you know, our career guidance, um, people going around the class going, what do you want to be? And I said, I want to be a surgeon. And I was told, well, everyone has pipe dreams. And at that moment, I went right then. <laughs> That's what I'm going to be. Mm -hmm. um, I did really want to study history, actually. And I applied to Cambridge. So I had this big thing then when I came to do my leaving, would I do history or study medicine? So I applied to Cambridge and they asked me to send over three essays. This is a true story. And I was reading FSL lines at the time, you know, Ireland since the famine kind of weighty mm -hmm. kind of formal sober tone um, but that's what my hair where my head was so I wrote essays on things like you know 800 years of domination and how Ireland might have done better in 1916 so mm -hmm. I went for a very stiff stiff interview um, and it all sounded like it was going to be very expensive so I studied medicine right okay wow what a what an interesting journey from uh, Fisher Price to Cambridge and um, ultimately a journey through medicine and like was this a um like were you fa following in some family footsteps or is um is medicine in your family at all um no not particularly i did have a great uncle who was a surgeon in st vincent's and i suppose there was a lot of chat about him but no in terms of my own family i was definitely a bit of an aberrant <laughs> gene i think um i've always been a bit of a misfit wherever i go and even in my own family but um yeah but i think I suppose I grew up in the 80s and um, I was just leaving school in 1988 um, my parents had done a lot of work in St. Vincent de Paul and I was very conscious of the real world I suppose um, and I was very conscious of contribution my father was always a great man for contribution but I just felt if I was going to have a life and have a career in that life what would it best be doing and um, and I always felt, well, look, medicine's a good thing. Um, and it was, and it is. And as well as that, you know, it is just such a vast area of knowledge. Um, you are never there. You're always learning. And just when you think, you know, you know something, you find out really you don't. And that's what I love about it, because it challenges you every single day. And I think it's true to say I learn something every day. And working with people is extraordinary. Not always easy, um, but always extraordinary. And what led you into the area of gynecology, you know, obstetrics? Yeah, it was literally my first, um, telling my first birth, um, you know, on the labour ward and seeing this baby emerge. And it was just that moment. It was so fundamental. It was so elemental. It was so important. And I just couldn't think of anything else in life that could be as important as being born. And actually, we're all born. It's the one thing, you know, lots of different things happen to us all, but everybody is born, so it's universal. But it's quite extraordinary to see a baby being born. And to this day, I mean, I haven't lost that wonder. You know, you a baby's kind of, <laughs> there's a moment when nothing happens and a baby is totally still. And then there's just this moment when it comes to life. And it always looks, babies always look so indignant <laughs> when they're born, as they are. But I just love, they just seem to have such personality. And there's just that moment of, um, transition um into that independence you know yeah. it sounds it sounds it sounds magical it sounds like such a singular experience to get to witness and then how different it must be in every single moment and um like i'm sure some people who are on us on the call this evening with us know i guess know you from your time as the master of the national maternity mm -hmm. hospital and 
I kind of, you know, I, I googled Rona Mahoney, Master of the National Maternity Hospital earlier this week, and, you know, there's an awful lot of people who speak very fondly of your accomplishments and your time there, but I kind of, from your own perspective, when you think of your role as Master and maybe some of the key moments or some of the key accomplishments from that time, what do you think of and what do you reflect on? I think really it was such a challenging role to take up. Remember when I, you know, first took up the job and said, well, if I did a year, that'd be really good, you know. Um, but actually, I thought what I really enjoyed about it was the breadth of experience that I gained. You know, I had at that stage been, you know, delivering babies and studying obstetrics and medicine for 17 years. Um, and now I got exposed to a much broader environment because when you're in obstetrician hospital, it's a bit like, it's a very closed area you know it's very exciting but it is all about birth it is you know very specific and very specialized um, and that's brilliant um, and you're working with brilliant people but all of a sudden you realize there's a whole world out there and that's really what opened my eyes you know I was meeting all kinds of lawyers not just medical negligence but you know in terms of we were running things at the board to you know we were looking at our governance um we were looking at how to make our service better we were looking at patient experience you were looking at everything from a different prism and then obviously the move to vincent's you were lobbying with government you were meeting all the ministers you were trying to get your story across um, you were imagining how the world could be and that has to be the best part of a job like that you have the capacity to to alter strategy to actually make a difference in terms of the future direction of childbirth and i was very struck by my first day as master I walked around the hospital and mm. literally part of our hospital are crumbling um, and it was all symptomatic of a lack of investment in childbirth the feeling that you know women's health is something out there it's sort of women's things um, and it's better not really talked about it and left alone but actually I come back to the whole concept of birth being universal and mm. um, how we deliver our babies is really important um, because Women's health isn't just about getting a baby born or looking after menopause. It's about equality in our society. Mm -hmm. And we know that societies who have good access to women's health, where women are cared for and their babies are cared for. That really is a reflection of a society that is sophisticated and advanced. And it's really a matter of destiny, human rights, if you like, um, whereby if that is ignored, the consequences are intergenerational and they are enormous in terms of um, individual's ability to achieve their potential and although we have come a long way in Ireland you know our history is quite stark in terms of what it was be to a woman in Ireland what it was to have children what it was to be anyway outside the social norms and I think we've learned through very difficult heartrending stories um, about what that is so I think every baby that's born so 25 babies leave Hollow Street every day and they will go into all kinds of different environments. And some of them will go to homes where everything is wonderful and there's so much love and everything is great. Some of them will go home to, you know, the tiger mums and everything about those children will be about achievement, what they achieve, what they don't achieve. And before they even get a chance to breathe hardly, there is a weight of expectation. Mm -hmm. But worst of all, some children will go to homes who don't care. And I can't imagine that, you know, kids, no one cares if you go to school, no one cares if you achieve anything. No one actually cares. Um, and that's the reality for so many babies. So society has to somehow be able to balance things a little bit so that every single child who's born can have some chance and that there is a chance to realise that potential because that's what it is to live. Yeah, that's you're you're such a wonderful kind of advocate for the, you know, the, the needs of the individual and the, the rights of an individual as you're talking about there. Um, and I kind of, I wonder if you look back at the medical practitioners that came before you throughout history, I, would there be one or two particularly key histor historic leaders that come to mind? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you saw the documentary last week on RTE, but it's just fascinating. So that's the story of this great surgeon, James Barry, um, who was born in the 1700s. Um, but anyway, James wasn't James. James was Margaret Ann Buckley from Cork. Um, her dad had been a grocer, um, but kind of fell foul of the social establishment in Cork, died young, leaving the family quite young. But luckily, her mum had some wealthy relatives, including the um, artist James Barry, who's also a great academician. Anyway, 
it's interesting that um, Margaret, or we call her James, it's going to get very confusing. Uh, but Margaret apparently had a baby as a teenager, Juliana, and that became another baby in that household, but was never acknowledged. So possibly the result of a rape or an unhappy relationship. But anyway, Margaret always wanted to be a surgeon. Mm -hmm. This is impossible because as a woman, you couldn't train in medicine. So after you have the question, but her family fell in hard times in court. They went to London and um, they met up with some of James Barry's friends and himself at the time. And they were all a bit wild, the libertarians. And they thought it'd be a bit of a wheeze, I think, and a really grand plan if Margaret was to go to university and study to be a doctor, but she would have to be a man. So they dressed her up as a man and she became James. And she went off to Edinburgh um, and she graduated at the age of 22. She then became a military surgeon, went off to Cape Town and actually was a huge humanitarian. She looked after water, sanitation, slavery. Um, she looked to provide sanctuary for people with leprosy. She's extraordinary, um, but became a brilliant, brilliant surgeon, but lived as a man. She did become very close <laughs> to Lord Somerset. Um, and I'm sure that was a relationship, but it was never declared. And it was all kinds of hint of scandal about her but she carried on and in fact did the first cesarean section one of the first cesarean sections and her patient survived um, but a huge contribution to medicine mm -hmm. and she was top of her class and brilliant um, and I think that was real leadership um, but sadly she never got to come out in her truth so when she they only discovered she was a woman when she died. What an amazing secret to have had to keep kind of throughout her life but an amazing contribution that she did make it's it was amazing she got away with it. i mean people didn't notice you know that she had very smooth skin and a high-pitched voice so there was always this feeling that she was a tri child prodigy sort of you know that because she was incredibly clever i think and there's always that feeling that this was actually a young boy but no she was and i mean awful to have to have hidden that but at the same time to be able to contribute so much um, and to have worked so hard and to have achieved so much. Um, so yeah, I'm going to put her down, her, him, <laughs> down as, um, yeah. Um, and I love that she was, you know, again, because I always love that, a little bit different, a bit of a misfit and kind of, you know, she found a solution and worked around something that really seemed impossible. And I love that, the idea that when something seems impossible, that somehow or other you can work around it and you can find a way. Yeah, that's, uh, there's always a solution if you go find it. Um, and the kind of, the last question I'm going to ask you about yourself, I promise, before I, um, <laughs> oh. the, um, just when you're, when you're talking about kind of unique accomplishments and kind of unique milestones, you know, it must be said, because you were the first woman to hold the position of mm -hmm. master of the maternity hospital, I kind of, I, I guess, I, I don't think I've ever asked you before, but I'm kind of curious, do you feel like, you approach that role differently in any way because of your gender or was it babies need to be born let's just get on with it yeah I don't think I did and I was I remember being asked this a lot of the time you know and it's the same job you know mm. you have to deliver baby by cesarean section you deliver your baby you know in an emergency on the labor ward through instrument you look after women antenatal care but also you look after the hospital and the difference that matters is the whole strategic direction of the hospital and it's the day-to-day -day management and operation of the hospital and women are well able to do that like there's lots of female CEOs you know running hospitals that are out there so no I didn't really think that gender was an issue when I started but all of a sudden it was just like first female master and I'm being like what you know I mean I'd grown up in a hospital where we had women you know and where we had quite a number of female consultants um, and it just wasn't an issue sort of internally it became this huge issue externally and then it's not great when you're five foot three and you're going around calling yourself the master <laughs> you know what I mean everyone is looking over your shoulder going where's the real master and I had a lot of that you know and I dye my hair I and mean, I probably am probably great but I wasn't admitting to that so there was a bit of that too she's too you know like because back then I was young this is now years ago um and I think there was that element but definitely yeah five foot three it just it was you know um it was hard to cut and actually women hated the term master as well I was always been getting given out to you know for still calling myself master and I was thinking well I could call myself mistress and I'm probably one of the few people that can be mistress and master at the same time um mm -hmm. that's a different story um but anyway um I thought it was important to keep the title because it was the same job and I thought it was important that everything didn't have to change because mm -hmm. a woman came into the role and the challenges were just the same mm -hmm. And it, it's funny though, because it is perception is ultimately what we're talking about and kind of the way 
the messaging is communicated in the media and conversation in whatever form it might be. But I know this is something that kind of interests you personally, this idea of how women have been perceived throughout time, going back to Eve, Pandora and everything in between. Yeah, you know, I'm going to say it now, women have never had great press. So, um, you know, let's go back. I mean, if we go back to ancient Greece, we have Pandora. So what was Pandora? Pandora was created as a punishment to Prometheus because he'd stolen the fire from the gods. And she was just awful. She was, a sh you know, she was given a shameless mind and thieving ways. Of course, she had this box that if you opened it, it was going to wreak havoc on the whole world. So enter Pandora. So that's Greek mythology. So not brilliant. And then we have Christian theology. We have Eve, you know, and of course, and one of the really unfair things about the story, I'll just digress for one moment about Adam and Eve is the fact that like Adam kind of came from dust apparently, but then Eve came from his rib, but he was put asleep, you know what I mean? So the rib was taken out and then Eve was made, but no such um, sleep or anesthetic has been given to women throughout the ages until we invented them ourselves. We had to endure the pain of childbirth. And of course, Eve, everything was perfect. Adam and Eve were very happy. And then of course, Eve um, was seduced by the serpent um, and she ate the apple and she was off and she made Adam eat the apple. It was all her fault, nothing to do with Adam. And then of course, as a result of that, um, Adam and Eve were, you know, expelled from the Garden of Eden and they were like punished by years of servitude on the awful earth. And also Eve was um, then condemned to painful labors and women because of Eve were condemned to painful labor. And then you have Thomas Aquinas came along and he was pretty straight out there. He just said that women were defective um, inferior and just misbegotten. So that was like Thomas Aquinas and the Summa Theological. So that's around the 1200s. Mm -hmm. um, and then anatomically, women weren't great either. I mean, Hippocrates and ancient Greece had this idea of the wandering uterus, that women had this wandering uterus inside them that would wander around your body. Whatever it landed, it would just do damage. And it could land in your head. And then that would make you really evil and really bad. And um, you would be bewitched. And of course, in the 16th century, 200,000 women were killed and so many more, you know, tortured because they were thought to be witches um, in the Middle Ages. So anybody transgressing any norm at all, you know, was a witch. And if a midwife delivered a normal baby, that's because she was a witch. So she would get kind of murdered. So it was no idle reservation. Mm. And then I suppose we kind of got over the witchcraft um, and that was quite good. But then we kind of went to the hysteria. And of course, hysteria, the word comes from uterus. And that's kind of Jean-Martin Charcot in Salpetriere in Paris in the 1800s. And they had already started locking up women actually in the 1800s in Paris. So prostitutes, poor women, found themselves in an institution. But he devised a theory that because you had a uterus, you were mad. And, you know, that was actually before PMS <laughs> and menopause were defined. So uh, there's just some of the examples, I suppose, um, of women. Irish women did a bit better. Mm -hmm. You know, you had the Breton laws, so you could own land, um, you could marry who you chose. You could also divorce the man if he was lazy, impotent, or gay on the 1st of February, so that was quite good. Um, and then you had people like Grace O'Malley, who I don't know if you've read, I mean, there isn't time tonight, but you have to read about Grace O'Malley. She had this great way of having a row, and every time she had a row, she left her castle. So she had loads of castles. She went around collecting castles, started off really wealthy, ran a brilliant, you know, merchant shipping business. Mm -hmm. um, and had a lover at one stage who was 15 years younger than her, which was really good. And then when it all broke up, she got his castle. So she was quite a mover. She sounds like a character. I must, um, yeah, I must spend some time researching her. But um, yeah. like, it kind of when you when you come to the Irish context, I um, I, I remember you gave a lecture in the little museum. Gosh, it must have been maybe four years ago at this stage. And mm. during that, you were talking about the history of giving birth in Dublin, and just through having not taken the time to think about it. Um, I, I remember in that, uh, during that lecture being staggered because you were talking about, you, you brought us to 1916 and you know we've got conflict going on throughout the course of the city. There's people dying, there's shots being fired, but simultaneously mm. our women are giving birth and that is something that's happening in parallel. Like, tell me a little bit about the history of the maternity hospital and what, I guess 1916. Yeah. Um, I mean, I suppose the hospital was founded in 1894 and it was part of the Catholic ascendancy. You had the return of the Coombe, which were kind of Protestant trusts, um, and the Catholics wanted one of their own. And now the Catholics are getting a little bit wealthier, you know, in the 1880s, 1890s. So National Maternity Hospital um, sprang from that. It was very strict as a non sectarian hospital um, because it needed 
money um, and donations from Protestants who generally had more money than Catholics. Um, and so the Queen actually gave us 50 quid um, in 1916, which was very good. But we have to remember, on a serious note, Dublin had the worst slums in Europe around that time. Um, and, you know, this was a huge area of poverty. And associated with that was alcoholism, child abuse, prostitution, um, child sexual abuse. Um, it was really a very difficult time. And that was reflected in a really high maternal mortality and perinatal mortality. So the maternal mortality then was around 340 per 100,000. Now it's about 3.6 in Hollow Street, you know, so I mean, a world of difference. The perinatal mortality was about 150 babies per thousand died. Um, and, and, you know, if you went out to the wealthier suburbs, that figure even then was around 70. The big issue was illegitimacy. Um, and I know we've talked a lot in this week, and I'm, we won't go too far into it, but the Magdalene's and the mother and baby homes. But the fact was that where babies were born out of wedlock, one in three of them died within the first year of life and half of those within the first two months because their mothers were really pushed to the edge of society. It wasn't tolerated. And there was all the denouncements from the altar um, and it was moral outrage. And there was nowhere for these women to go. Mm -hmm. Many of them had worked in domestic service and some of them probably becoming pregnant by the you know, droit de seigneur, but that was the end of them. They were out on the street and there was nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. um, and that was reflected in a huge um, mortality. Uh, and so it was very difficult times, you know, and a lot of, we had a lot of casual workers trying to put ends to the table. You had women trying to borrow pawn and steel to feed their families. Um, and in the middle of this, Hollow Street is trying to grow up. And, you know, when you think of 1916, you'd had the lockout of 1913, you still had all that unrest, all of that difficulty. And now 1916 comes. And actually the first baby born in Hollow Street in January 1916 was Lily Kyo. And it was a, a or the two Lily Kyo, and Lily's husband was a lamplighter. And I always see there's a great symbolism in that because that was the year where the destruction of Dublin and the execution of the rebels would actually light the switch that would really push us towards our independence. But there was 14 babies born during 1916 and the Labour Ward Register gives you a brilliant clue about how life was in Dublin then. So um, I guess our first lady came from North Strand and she was a widower and she was 19. Um, we had another lady from City Key who preeclampsia her baby was two pounds of birth and died after 10 minutes. Um, and, and the labor register is quite brutal. It just says she was fairly well. <laughs> and when she went home 10 days later, they said she was all right. Um, there was also a very posh woman called Constance um, who was married to a brigadier or was married to a, a sergeant major in the British army. And in fact, out of the 14 women, five women were married to soldiers who were fighting in England. And that was a real reality at the time, whether because of economic necessity or a wish for the unification of Ireland, North and South, or a wish for Ireland and England, um, 40,000 Irish men volunteered in the First World War and so many of them didn't come back. Um, and in fact, during 1916, there was a battle in near Luz in a village called Hullock in France um, and the Irish battalions were fighting and the Germans put up big signs in the trenches to say, you know, the rebellion is happening in Ireland and any of those Irish men that did survive went on to the Somme. Mm -hmm. And we'd see huge casualties, Suvla Bay, um, Salonica, um, Hells, Cape Hell, so many Irish men died, we never acknowledged them. And then in the rising then, that week of fighting, Mount Street became mm -hmm. one of the worst, bloodiest battles of the whole rising. Mm -hmm. You had the uh, Sherwood Foresters coming from England. They were all young regiment and um, half their grenades and all their artillery never came with them. Mm -hmm. And so when they arrived in Dunleary, all the local people came out to clap them. And by the time they got into Mount Street under Mick Malone, who was one of the rebels, mm -hmm. um, they were shot at. Um, and so many of them killed. General Lowe, who was kind of in charge of operations during the rebellion on the English side, um, ordered them across the bridge in Mount Street. They could have taken an alternative route, mm -hmm. um, but ordered them across the bridge. Um, and so going over the top, I mean, some hadn't happened yet, but that was literally going over mm -hmm. the top. So Hollow Street that day or during that time treated 40 people, men and children as well. So you had this juxtaposition and we took the dead bodies off the street. So you had this juxtaposition of Hollow Street, the mortuary, and Hollow Street, the maternity hospital. And I suppose never again would you have such a stark juxtaposition um, of life and death. 
mm-hmm. Mick Malone, who ran the Rebels in Mount Street, was killed also um, during the the um, that part. And that was when the English really put their foot down. The ca- you know the big cannons came in. And mm-hmm. um, De Valera was a few streets away with a hundred fighters, but he didn't help them. Mm-hmm. It's it's amazing to see how the I guess how the how the hospital had to be adaptive and responsive to I guess life as it was happening outside the hospital while simultaneously bringing new life into the world mm. um, and like I know you know some of the some people that we know as key figures from 1916 like Elizabeth O'Farrell as an example mm. went on to actually train in the maternity hospital as a midwife and I kind of I'd be fascinated to know a little bit more about how the role of women in medicine has actually been perceived over the years you've spoken us more generally about women through time but oh it's fun i mean there's a lot of there's a fun bit there's I mean first is with the fire obviously she carried the flag you know that surrendered so it's an amazing story gpo is burning the rebels are trying to get to the forecourts they can't they get as far as moore street elizabeth pierce is there Connolly is injured and dying and you know pierce is or o'farrell is sent out to negotiate with general Lowe about the surrender um, and so they decide she's going to carry the white flag accompanied it has to be said at various times by um I think was it Rogal and Lowe, whom she later said were very nice people. Um, but she goes first to the four courts and then she's going towards the side to Countess Markiewicz. Mm-hmm. And then she goes over to visit De Valera, who was, um, was he in Boland Mills? But anyway, he's hiding out, but he won't accept her because she's a woman. So he won't accept the fact that she has instruction for him to surrender. So she has to go over then um, to Jacob's Bakery to McDonough. And what's really tragic there is as they are um, giving in, um, one of the men, two men give Elizabeth money. One gives her three pounds for his mother. That's all his savings and asks her to give this money because he knew he'd die. And the other poor man gave her 13 pounds for the wedding he'd never have to his wife because these young men knew that they would die. So there was all of that story. Um, Elizabeth O'Farrell did indeed go on to train in midwifery and um, how you got in really, how you got on um, was um, quite financial and quite fiscal. So if you paid loads of money, you got very good results. So we can look from the registers and see that whichever midwife's family could pay loads of money to the hospital, there was a direct correlation with mm-hmm. academic achievement um, and ability. Um, so there you go. But for wh- for doctors, it was quite interesting because actually what people don't appreciate is that Ireland was, or Dublin, was one of the first cities to admit women to study medicine. Mm-hmm. So we were very ahead. And by the late 1800s, um, we were being let in to study medicine, the Queen's Colleges, um, Royal College of Surgeons, Trinity were the last. They didn't admit women until 1904. Okay. Um, but there was a big debate at the time, actually, about women kind of getting into medicine. And it was great fun. It ran through the Lancet and the newspapers. And I have a few quotes here. Mm. Uh, but there was a British psychiatrist. This is all kind of 1898, around that time. So Henry Maudsley, who was a British psychiatrist, said that um, in intellectual labour, man has surpassed, does now and will always surpass woman for the obvious reason that nature does not periodically interrupt his her thought for reason <laughs> so um you can imagine um, imagine saying that now like it's great fun um and um in america dr edward clark i think might have been either harvard or baltimore but anyway he said that too much education and mental exertion threatened women's physical development especially when undertaken during menstruation and the lancet in 1870 of course it said that no woman in any dangerous crisis calling for calm nerve and prompt action would trust herself in the hands of a woman. But I love the Irish Times in 1907 because they wrote an article entitled Women Doctors Dead Failures. Um, And they said that women would fail as doctors because they are singularly (laughs) unsuccessful in much that they undertake. And I am afraid that the plain unvarnished truth is that all the best work of the world has been and always will be done by men. So that was our introduction. And actually in 1904 in Edinburgh, and that's actually where uh, James Barry studied. In 1904, there was a riot in the class um, because four women had been admitted to medicine and their fellows staged a riot. So um, there you go. But Dublin was ahead along with Europe. We were the two European cities that were ahead in admitting women. And that may have been a Catholic influence because some women obviously went to the missions 
Mm. and they became doctors and actually to be fair the nuns in the voluntary hospitals always allowed the women onto the wards because of that missionary background and that very practical background I suppose so in fact um, women did well in medicine in Ireland relatively. Okay I those um those quotes but aren't they? <laughs> There are two, um, yeah, periods and emotions. It's a terrible combination, but um, God, you know, God help us. Yeah. Oh, it's amazing. Um, and so it, it's incredible to kind of hear, I guess, some of the positives in terms of, you know, what we as the Irish have done at kind of relatively early stages and how women managed to actually get into the education to go on to get onto the wards, as you were saying. Um, but I kind of, I know as we come towards the free state, there is there's limitations that women are facing yeah. at this point. I mean, absolutely. The Free State was fascinating because, I mean, the first point is that how many women fought in 1916 and they were right on the front line. We've just described this about a Farrell, but you've, you know, you have Kathleen Lynn, um, so many women who fought and they all fought because they believed that the Republic would claim the allegiance of every Irish woman and guarantee religious and civil liberty with equal rights and opportunities to all its citizens. So women believed that the Free State would be somewhere where they would enjoy freedom and the ability um, you know, to carry on. And obviously women kind of enjoyed 1916 to a point you had to come in and on, you know, where now you weren't sitting at home knitting and cooking, but you're actually learning how to use weapons, you know, and um, this is the fire used to be, they always used to be training and marching and arming. And it was really exciting compared to staying at home cooking. So there was that element of it and they were part of it. And they were there in the GPO, you know, they were there on Moore Street, they were there right in the middle of it. But what happened then, the Free State comes in, and my goodness, what a disappointment that it seemed to be that women were literally um, to be written out of um, any sort of really functional existence and contribution to that free state. So all of the laws that were brought in, you know, there was the civil service examination bill, for example, said that women couldn't sit certain exam exams. There was employment legislation, you know, God forbid there would be a woman in the army, you know, um, and a male telephonist. There was the juries bill as well, you know, which precluded women from sitting on juries because of the extra delicacy um, of Irish women, but of course, many of the cases coming through the courts mm -hmm. um, were in fact cases of sexual abuse, of rape, um, but women had no means of being judged by their peers. And Kevin O'Higgins famously said that if you allowed women onto juries and they had to attend court all day, who would be at home to cook lunch? That would be um, an impossibility. Um, so it wasn't easy. Um, and we had the marriage bar, you know, which was only lifted, I mm -hmm. suppose, in 1973. Um, and then you had the Carrigan Commission, you know, 1930-ish, um, and that was a real snapshot of what was happening in terms of sexuality, age of consent, you know, prostitution, and it was an alarming report in terms of exposing what was really happening. Um, it resulted in two things. One, it raised the age of consent for sexual activity to 17 from 12, but it also was really a precursor of the Criminal Law Amendment Act of 1935. Um, and that was a, a really important law for women because that stopped contraception. It meant that it wasn't just a moral matter, but actually was a criminal offense to import contraception or to use contraception. That had a massive impact um, on women's ability to take part um, in life, to have career. Um, and you know, we had seen this kind of Catholic influence, you know, we had um, the Eucharistic Congress of 1931, a million people attending, John McCormick singing at it, huge celebration of the um, free state, but also a very kind of um, key message really as to how close church and state would be um, and that impact on women. Um, so not having access to contraception had a huge impact. Mm. But then the kind of the journey towards, I guess, the, the condom train, as it's known anecdotally, and mm. Mm. Right, it must have been a key milestone for women in that way. It really was. Um, you know, it had been, I suppose, an ongoing debate. And I guess, you know, 1968, you had Humana Vitae, you know, and everybody thought um, that the, you know, there would be a papal um, direction that now, you know, the, you could re relax on contraception and people really believed that this teaching was going to change or that it would be phrased in such a way the teaching would remain, but there would be sort of a way around it. Uh, and people were very excited and that didn't happen. 
Um, and then, yeah, 1971, you have the condom train. And it's kind of a funny story. Uh, women go up to Belfast um, to get all the um, pills. But actually, you have to have a prescription even in Belfast to get the pills. They couldn't get the pills. So they had a box of aspirin and then a few condoms. Um, and they were waving these on the platform. But I always think it was such a brilliant um you know it was bold mm -hmm. it got the message across it attracted that attention but you know you had very serious and you had you know 1993 Hannah McGee you know the court case uh, Mary Robinson was involved in it um, and this was a woman who had been told that because of an aneurysm in her brain that if she got pregnant again she might die mm -hmm. And so she wanted to use contraception and she went to the court um, and the judgment said that, yes, she could use contraception within marriage, but only because of her husband's right to marital privacy and um, not because of the risk to her um, life. I think there's a book, Who is the Body? Where is the Body of Hannah McGee? But it was a fascinating story. Um, but I guess we were joining Europe in 1973 and that did give us a broader um, less, you know, uh, different environment where mm. women's rights, I suppose, um, were much more prominent. And we saw the end of the marriage bar. And we saw a new, um, I suppose, place where we could explore uh, um, our rights. But for me, contraception, and we had, you know, women had to go on having baby after baby um, and they could not have tubal ligation. So women having cesarean section, women who had genuine, you know, um, risk from ongoing babies, uh, this really was a problem, not just in terms of their mental health, but their physical health. It's really unacceptable that this autonomy wasn't there. And, and this was reflected then, if you couldn't work, how could you contribute? You know, and we had kind of, we still have it actually, the constitution which says, you know, women's place in the home is protected. Mm -hmm. um, and we still have, you know, those women who have to give up work because they got married. And the marriage bar only went in, in, in 73. Mm -hmm. But also we saw Countess Markievicz in 1919, the first woman in the doll. But, you know, it was 22 dolly in six decades until we got to 1981 when the number of women mm -hmm. in Irish politics exceeded 10. Mm -hmm. And I think that had a huge impact on things like childminding and on our policy. One of the biggest problems we have now in Ireland is access to childcare. And when we look at all the IBEC reports and people talk about the talent pipeline and why women come out of university, but they don't get to the big careers, we hear all this nonsense about, oh, well, that's just because women don't push themselves, women don't believe in themselves, women are different, they do work differently. No, it's not. It's because women have babies during their 30s at that very time when your career is flying. And, and because there is not good child care or because a husband is not going to stay at home to mind the baby, then her, you know, your career is really badly impacted. And I see this all the time in my um, life as an obstetrician. I see so many brilliant women sitting in front of me and they have a baby and that's kind of it for their careers, particularly in medicine and law and those careers that demand that you are present a long time. And I remember my own husband, you know, he stayed at home, he's a dentist, but he stayed at home. Uh, he used to work in the morning and stayed home to collect the kids and mind them. And people used to look at them and say, this fellow mustn't have a job, you know, like what does he do that he can be collecting the children and they, you know, the mothers all loved him because he's kind of a bit of a novelty and he knew he was on the WhatsApp, he is on the WhatsApp, you know, with all the mothers groups and, um, but there's such a stigma mm. um, and still there is a stigma at the school gate if you were a man and you were staying at home to mind your children, but why is that? Mm. Um, why not? I mean, yes, the physiology is inherently really unfair. Um, and it is a pity that it's only the kind of seahorses where the male can have babies. But the truth is we have to have the babies. But should that be sort of perpetuated into mm -hmm. that meaning that we must then um, be the ones always to be at home um, and to sacrifice our career? But the Irish state very much promoted that. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't unique to Ireland. You had the Kinderkirche and Küche in Germany. Um, in the 1930s, the idea of women, home and kitchen, etc. cetera. Um, and then we have, of course, De Valera, you know, that famous speech in 1943, celebrating 50 years of kind of, you know, Irish language. But, you know, De Valera's conjuring this rural idol. And it's the famous misquoted speech where we talk about dancing, the comedy maidens dancing at the crossroads. He actually never said that. He did, in fact, write of Comley, although he said happy in a radio interview, maidens whose firesides would be the forms for the wisdom of serene old age. And he had this idea, you know, that you had all these sturdy children, women by the fire, women at home, and it was all perfect. And maybe it is, 
or maybe it's very reductive. I will leave people to draw their own conclusion. Um, but it was anything but behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And then we come to the Magdalene laundries and we come to what happened to women in Ireland who transgressed social norms and particularly women who got pregnant um, outside of um, marriage. Um, I can't imagine what those women felt. Some mm. of them have been raped, some of them raped by their fathers, um, some of them have been in love, but they found themselves pregnant and that was it. And they were no longer acceptable as people. They had no rights and um, they were locked up, they were incarcerated. And there was even a hierarchy of incarceration. You went to a mother and baby home, if it was your first, but if you were even worse and irredeemable, you went to a Magdalene. So a hierarchy um, of punishment um, and those girls' lives utterly interrupted. And nobody was locking up the men and the men weren't really queuing up to take responsibility. But um, I think it's a horror story when we read back. And I just imagine some 15, 16 year old who so needed to be cared for and loved and found herself in this um, environment. Because even when you are happily having a baby and it's your choice, it's a pretty scary time, but what it must have been. And remember, these women had no education. They did not understand what was happening to them. They didn't know where a baby came from. Mm. And we saw that in the mother and child debacle. You know, we saw um, the genesis of the mother and child scheme was the excessive perinatal mortality in Dublin and in Ireland um, among um, both mothers and among babies. Um, and there was a paper prepared in the department. It was Connor Ward on the sec gens mm -hmm. and you had um, Dr. Ryan. Um, and actually it wasn't all just Noel Brown. You know, there was lots of contributions before that. But what you saw play out was that, you know, closeness between the church and state and in fact when we looked at McQuaid's papers um, so many of the papers from government were in his possession so Costello himself was certainly talking mm -hmm. obviously no man had gone to visit Archbishop House and hadn't gone on so far but one of the key objections and there's all that stuff about socialism and about interfering with family privacy so this was the apparent um, objection but a lot of it and in fact the element of the mother and child scheme that was first dropped dropped earliest was the education of women um, and the fact that they could choose a doctor because they might go to a Protestant doctor who might tell them about how you get pregnant and how to prevent it. And so at all costs, women should not understand what it is to how to become pregnant, what happens when you become pregnant, and more importantly, what happens when you give birth. And I think one of the things when we look back at the magazines that isn't talked about enough is how awful it must have been to give birth when you didn't know what was happening to your body. Mm -hmm. and the pain of it and the fear of it and the isolation and, and the effect it had, um, you know, and the baby's been taken away from you and wondering for your whole life where that baby was, you know. Um, and even when we brought in adoption in 1952, there's a big scandal. It's all the babies going to America and the photographs of babies being shipped to New York. And what a lifetime of horror to give to a woman to have those memories and to not know where her baby was, live or dead. And I just don't think that can be really understood. Um, I, you know, you can only experience that. Um, so they were dark days. Um, and I think we learned a lot from them. Um, and so we still though, need to equip our young people with knowledge and information about their bodies so that they have the autonomy to make good choices um, mm. and to be loved and to love, um, but where that is celebrated and not. Because at the end of the day, <laughs> nature means us to have babies. That's the whole point, you know? And yes. that's what I love about reproduction too. It doesn't stop. It's, a, it's an imperative. It's a human imperative. There's mm. an urgency about it. Women will always um, have babies, but that must not, um, must not become, um, something of a punishment um, and I've had women come up to me we used to have an, an up to ward in Hollow Street where single mums would go because I don't think it was that they weren't allowed to contaminate other wards I do think it was a kindness because they were young and in the same boat and I, I think and they were given epidurals in labour so there was a degree of kindness but nonetheless they were labelled mm -hmm. and they were different and they were separate and so many women felt that you know, first babies are really tough to have. We get a lot of complication, but many of those women thought those complications came because they deserved it. Oh gosh, what a unfathomable. And I have so many, you know, so many stories I could tell of individual women, but that for me was just the horror of it. Mm. And these women did not feel worthy um, and they deserved it, which they didn't. And that's, that's heartbreaking. And I, I, I think, you know, as, 
as someone who's, you know, a female in the 30 something age bracket, you know, it's babies and so forth. It, it, it's a huge subject of conversation within my friend group. It's something that, you know, is very much top of mm-hmm. the mind for a lot of us. And the idea of the lack of knowledge and awareness and kind of not being informed in these situations is just the struggle that that must have presented is heartbreaking. But I kind of, I guess, something that I know I've asked you the last few times that we've spoken um, is just kind of, obviously, we're living through a particularly strange and kind of singular time at the moment in the pandemic as well. And I kind of wonder, like, just tell us a little bit about what we know so far about, I guess, pandemics and pregnancy within a maternity mm-hmm. house, what the experience is like. I mean, it's been quite in, obviously it's fascinating and to live through it and to work through it is really something else. And we've been very fortunate in the maternity sector. Um, so I guess in the first and second wave, we saw relatively few cases um, of COVID-19 or indeed of women with infection with SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19. Um, it was fascinating um, and in those initial months up to kind of the end of July we saw that pregnant women were five times less likely to first of all contract SARS-CoV-2 than equivalent women of their own age group and mm. um, obviously women getting pregnant are in that bracket sort of 20 to 44 generally and that's a good bracket to be in because you're young and you handle the virus well mm. so we really haven't seen that many very sick women and I'm finding it really strange because I come to Hollow Street every day. The babies still get born. We can't stop birth. We can't delay it. At the beginning of the pandemic, we were maybe a little fearful because we knew we'd still have to come to work every day. But in a way, that made it easier because it's just like there's no messing here. You just got to go to work and that's it. So there's no point in getting yourself into a state. So we just went to work and actually was fine. And you get confidence and you keep on working and the work keeps turning and it's fine. Um, And we'd be particularly lucky. We will, though undoubtedly as the infection goes through community we are starting to test more so we're starting to get more positive results but we've been so fortunate so far not to have patients who were very sick in Hollywood when you had about two or three patients who've really been ill and they've got better so quickly because their physiology is so good but there will be some cases still I think and we could even see a maternal death um you know that is always there in the background but so far we've been extraordinarily lucky I remember swine flu in 2009 and that seemed much more severe. It seemed to particularly affect pregnant women. So a lot of viral illnesses will particularly affect pregnant women with third trimester. So chicken pox can cause a very nasty pneumonia. Swine flu, flu can cause very nasty pneumonia. And of course, where you have a big bump, then resuscitation becomes very difficult. And then you have the decisions about um, do you deliver the baby while mm-hmm. someone is very septic and very sick, or do you wait, hope that the flu will resolve and then deliver everyone everything's fine? Mm-hmm. One of the other very reassuring things has been that we were not really seeing transmission to babies um, in cases of COVID-19. So even women who've had COVID pneumonia, who've been sick, we are not seeing a vertical transmission is what we call it to the baby. There are some very sophisticated studies looking at antibodies that suggest that it's possible and that it does happen, but it doesn't seem either probable or very common. Mm -hmm. And so we have had very few babies infected uh, with the virus. There have been one or two, um, but that's really rare. We think of all the babies being born. Um, So one of the reasons why and the question is why are women not getting really sick and why is it not like swine flu where it actually disproportionately affects women and I think one reason is women are cocooning Mm -hmm. and it could be the fact they have a bump means they're very visible and people really step away and you know you are really vulnerable you're pregnant and I also think that they have either no children or young children so they don't have teenagers who are out about coming back into the house their kids tend to be young and also it could be that there's an immune modulation Mm -hmm. Um, so pregnancy, as we know, alters your immune system because you have to accept a whole foreign. I mean, babies are pretty, as it comes to foreign bodies, you know, babies are a pretty good example of a foreign body, literally. So your in pregnancy, our immune system has to accommodate um, this other person. So it could be that the immune modulation means that we don't get that, what we call the inflammatory cascade. So in COVID-19, what tends to happen is you get a viremia to start with. So that's the viral infection. You get your aches and your pains and your temperature and you're really sick. 
but it switches on the virus gets into each cell and about eight or 10 different mechanisms it switches on your immune system which causes this big cascade of inflammation within your body as your immune system fights the virus and that's actually what gives people the shock lung the pneumonia um, and also the myocarditis which is often what kills people particularly with underlying disorder and um, where they can't handle that so it is it's the inflammatory cascade and the immune response actually that kills mm. people and makes them very sick so possibly pregnancy modulates that although against that some of the american papers suggest that pregnant women do get it more severely and um, but i don't think we'll know for sure um mm. for a few years until we look back but so far the irish experience of pregnancy has been good really reassuring um and that's been fantastic yeah. so on a personal level it's kind of odd because you read the news you know you read the paper and you're watching the news and then you're just going to work and mm. someone's still five centimeters someone still has a normal ctg and um, someone still has you know pelvic pain or you know whatever um and somebody still is day three going i don't know if i really want a baby but it has been very frightening for women mm. um and it has like pregnancy is anxious enough so you know, it is good to be able to reassure women coming through the system and um, who are having a baby that it's going to be OK. Mm -hmm. And women have been really robust, actually. I'm really impressed mm -hmm. by my patients. They just take it on the chin and they mind themselves, but they're really brave and they really um, get on with it. It's quite mm -hmm. extraordinary. Um, and then, you know, it's hard because like while in hospital dads can attend the birth they can't attend all the antenatal visits so that kind of fun journey is not the same and then after the baby's born we have restricted visiting and mm -hmm. i guess if you have a really traumatic delivery you know and like for some women it's the first time they've been a doctor's never mind in theater in the middle of everything have an emergency section where everyone is rushing along going you know the ctg is wrong you know and mm -hmm. like it, obstetrics goes wrong quickly one minute everything is perfect it's all very routine the next minute it's pandemonium you know mm -hmm. it is a very unpredictable business and women can feel very isolated in those few days after birth that's quite difficult mm -hmm. so women having their third and fourth baby kind of love it so they get to stay in the hospital for a couple of days maybe with no husband and no children and some of them are really delighted but that's a different story <laughs> sorry that's the reality of home deliveries um but it's funny actually because I think when you joined the Little Museums board originally, I mm. I think we didn't foresee the day in which we were ringing you up asking for medical advice in the way that we have found ourselves <laughs> in the past twelve months. But um, I guess kind of curiosity from my own part, I kind of I don't think I've ever actually asked. I wonder, I, I guess, kind of your, your love of history is kind of painting a picture for everyone with us this evening, but you might just tell me a little bit about your own relationship to the Little Museum and kind of how you got involved. <clears throat> so I suppose, yeah, I mean, I had always loved history. And then I am working in Hollow Street, so you're nipping into town and you're nipping around the place. And I saw this little place called the Little Museum. And I thought, oh, that's such a lovely name. And then it was such a lovely building on Stevens Green. And I'm a real Dubliner as well. I'm born and bred in Dublin. There's three generations of Dublin behind me. And I'm a Northside Dubliner, just to put it out there. <laughs> um, and so I've been really proud of my city always. And I've always loved growing up in Dublin. It's a beautiful city. You know, I grew up on the north side in Rohini, but we we're close to the sea, out to Hoth, Dolly Mount. Um, and then you come into Georgian Dublin mm -hmm. um, and that had such a rich history. And then my dad worked in the SB, so, um, and they had obviously destroyed Georgian Dublin. So I, I didn't feel the personal responsibility, but I had become aware of this destruction early on and how precious our city was. Mm -hmm. And I love, Stevens Green, Marion Square. I love Dublin in the summer. I love Sunday mornings in Dublin. And so here was this little museum of Dublin. So I went in for one of the tours and what really got me was the licorice all sorts. I know you can't even do that now, but in the jar and you could actually eat them. I thought I was robbing them because I did rob a few. And then someone said, no, it's actually fine. You can have them. So that took some of the joy out of it. But, um, but the museum tour was just so, I like, I suppose there is nostalgia because I almost, feel that I have a sense of my grandparents and their stories and growing up and um, a sense of older people growing up and bang bang you know some of the characters that existed in Dublin and we always have those great stories um, and here the stories are being toned and illustrated and the photographs were so evocative of my growing up but also what I imagine my grandmother growing up my grandmother lived to be 98 she's quite extraordinary um, and it gave me a sense of being and a sense of belonging I suppose and a sense of community and then I met all you guys and 
I, I, the exhibitions were always so authentic and mm -hmm. so different and so real and so properly executed. They were just brilliant. And there was nothing um, cheap about it. Like we learned about elements of our past that maybe we mightn't have understood, but it was distilled beautifully for us through a prism that was just so informative and so educational, um, but also so real. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what I loved about it. Um, so yeah, and I love going in and I love the atmosphere there and I love the exhibitions and I love meeting people. And I love stepping out of obstetrics, to be honest, because <laughs> uh, you're always worrying about something, you know, you're always either worried about something you did, you didn't do. Um, and then you would go there and I just felt a sense of being part of something in my city, belonging to my city. I think that's really it, isn't it? Being a citizen of Dublin and like almost a badge. I am a citizen, I belong here. And this is somewhere that I belong. Mm. I do keep coming back to my whole misfit. You know, I have this thing, I don't fit anywhere. It's a common thing, phenomenon for people, but um, yeah. but the little museum makes you belong. Oh, that's that's really beautiful. I think the kind of the level of support and advice you've given us over the years has been really quite incredible. And um, I think you are kind of coming near the end of the evening now. And I think you, you, you've, you've given us such a span of kind of some of the key events and the key moments in the kind of the history of giving birth in Dublin over the past kind of, hundred ish years and some of the changes that happened in society over the time it's it's been really um it's been really fascinating but I kind of I guess the kind of the natural question just to end on is kind of if we look at where we were in 1916 we look at where the maternity hospital was you know just over 100 years ago when you look towards the future you know what are you hopeful for for maternal medicine 100 years from now I think the future is here already kind of, and it's trying to keep up with the future is our problem. So when we look back to 1916, obviously the big things that killed women were hemorrhage, infection, and we had no antibiotics, we had no blood transfusion, and we had no neonatal care. So the three biggest advances over the last hundred years have been the advent of antibiotics, um, introduction of blood transfusion, um, and neonatal intensive care. And that's why we have so reduced our perinatal mortality because we can now keep babies alive from 500 grams and 24 weeks when previously a baby really had to be termed to survive. So the strides have been extraordinary. But look where we are now in terms of birth and how birth is changing. So um, I would have said to you 20 years ago, babies are either born by cesarean section, vagina delivery, et cetera. Soon we might have a baby in a laboratory you know, and it's, we've already had a sheep in a laboratory. It's not a million miles away. And um, so we have IVF. You know, we think back to 1979 and um, 1978, a year before the Pope came. And um, we had Stepto and we had Louise Brown, the first test tube baby. Mm -hmm. And that changed utterly our future. Um, and now we can, you know, where we have no sperm, we can pick one sperm and actually choose the best sperm and inject it into an egg, it's called ICSI. Um, IVF success is much better. And of course, so many of our women defer childbirth. So the demographic has changed completely. 10% of women holiday are over 40 having a baby um, and having their first baby often um, with all of that risk. So we have increased BMI, we've totally, and women with medical complications, a very different group. But we can now buy eggs, you know, you can sell eggs, you can buy eggs, you know, we have Facebook advertising that you can freeze eggs if you want to work with their company. But the most, is it frightening or is it brilliant, I'm not sure, is the Human Genome Project, where you can read all the DNA in a human cell. Um, and now there's a project to write the DNA. So not quite editing DNA, but maybe someday. So using a kind of crisp technology where you can splice off bits of junk DNA or bad DNA and you can fix that. So my job is fetal medicine. So I look after babies that have um, abnormality or genetic um, differences. Um, but what if you can fix that before implantation? So already we can do a certain amount of pre-implantation genetic diagnosis so we can take a fertilized egg and sperm and we can look at the chromosomes of that baby before implantation, actually make a choice about whether that egg should be um, implanted. And we can look and find the best embryo. So we can grow a baby in a Petri dish for a few days, um, actually up to a few weeks, um, but the law has stopped us doing that. And then we can choose that before implantation and with, so we can choose the best quality embryo. And actually we can watch while the embryo is developing. We have cameras now that can follow that process in the laboratory so we can see how it's going. But what if in the future then you could almost choose to be the, you know, the best genetic version of you as a couple, the best sperm, the best egg. So what if 
you now, it's like drinking and driving. To have sex, make love and get pregnant is irresponsible because it's a genetic risk. You know, what if you now need to control that and you can control that and you can create a different genetic destiny? That is terrifying because the whole point of humanity is diversity um, and humanity and being different and not being perfect and being flawed. And actually, I suspect reproduction relies on that. Um, but what if you start to really tamper with that? Mm -hmm. um, and already the technology is there. You know, already um, we can do so much. And part of that is brilliant. The management of infertility is absolutely brilliant. But where do we draw the line and how do we draw the line? Because it's a huge business um, and it's pretty frightening. So I think what we have to do is humanity has to keep up with technology. We have to recognize what is good for us mm -hmm. without judging and without imposing any of our own beliefs. But we have to now determine what and how society will develop because what we're capable of is vast outstripping mm -hmm. um, where we are thinking, I think, and um, what we're doing. So if you look in Ireland, for example, and look at simple IVF, you can transfer as many embryos into a woman's uterus as you like. There's no legislation around it. Now, obviously, it's really dangerous to put in more than one embryo, two embryos, you know, um, but you could do it. So mm -hmm. we don't have the legislation. Every time we try to go to the legislation, it's incredibly complicated. Think of some of the Supreme Court cases we've had. Who is the mother? Is it the owner of the egg or is it the person who gives birth? Or, the questions are enormous. And you can have loads of parents now. You can have your biological parents, your egg parents, you know, um, and what should children be told and what is it about our identity? Um, and these are all, so birth is in a different place now. And the technology as I said is outstripping I think our ability to keep up in humanitarian terms but we have to be so careful mm. because the future is here it's possible um, and medicine is really changing um, and it's all going to be about genomes it's all going to be about who we are we are going to be able to be born and characterize what kind of diseases we're going to get we can do this already so you can look at your own genome and decide well i'm going to get this disease that disease i'm predisposed to this disease so we can really personalize medicine we can now decide that this drug will work better for me because this is how i metabolize things and um, you know we can operate in new york on someone who's in amsterdam using robots um, prosthesis are better than the original limb you know so soon you'll have the olympics for people with prosthesis because they'll be so much better than people with the original limbs mm -hmm. you know instead of doing colonoscopies if you have horrible gut problems you can swallow a tablet now and it can beam photographs um to your phone and what a selfie that would be you know does my colon <laughs> look big in this you know but um medicine is really different now the mm -hmm. technology is really different and on the one hand we are slow to embrace it um, in a bad way in terms of being able to deliver better healthcare, but on the other, we must be very careful. Um, mm -hmm. We have a frightening capability. The um, but the, the conversations around ethics, humanities, and everything in between. It's I I don't envy yourself and your colleagues, but it sounds like it's um, fascinating. I um, I saw someone write in a little while ago just to say that they were really enjoying this evening. As, uh, as Linda says, an amazing lady both a doctor and a historian who knows her Irish history so well. Um, Rona, I think I genuinely could sit here for the evening and very happily would, but um, we've somehow come to the end of the hour. And so I guess the, um, I would dare say that was a very well purchased Fisher Price toy when you were a child <laughs> that the parents gifted you. Um, so I think just kind of to take the opportunity just to say your support to the museum over the last few years is really been very much noted and appreciated and your time here tonight has been really fascinating to listen to so Rona thank you so much for everything and uh, no, Sarah thank you and I think I've benefited much more honestly um, not just for the part but also um, just for just the people you are in the little museum you're amazing I think what you do is fantastic and it's such a privilege um, to know you so thank you well likewise and to everyone who's here this evening you're all part of that so thank you so much um so that's it for another week of 120 dublin stories with santa rita and the little museum so we'll see you all next week and rona thank you again good evening good night good night